Venomous Duck Media presents Gareth and the Lost Island Episode 4 The Glorious Dawn Disclaimer This audio drama should be considered rated PG-13 for discussions of sexual hijinks, drinking, consuming questionable potions, brief moments of violence, crude language, and even cruder humour. Please use caution when listening in public, as this story may cause audible laughter. Venomous Duck Media is not liable for any strained abdominal muscles you may receive while listening, or the strange looks you might get from other commuters. If laughter persists for more than four hours, seek immediate medical attention. Izzy Morgana, I would like to introduce you to my good friend, Antrolus's butler, Henry, of the Wuha clan. <laughs> well met, Master Chim. Give me a boost up onto the driver's bench, Henry. Need a hand, miss? Why, thank you, good sir. Sorry, Henry, but the front bench only holds three, so it looks like I'll be sitting in the back. <laughs> Yeah, well, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, pfft. to you too, pal. Identification papers, please. Just a moment. I know I have them somewhere. Here you go, sir. Since you're obviously not a ground pounder, I need to think up a polite way to uh, ask this. <sighs> I hated how my hair looked, so I had it cut short right after I had that photo taken. Try covering up the extra hair with your finger. Oh, I see it now. Everything is in order. Proceed through that gate into the tunnel and wait your turn to be admitted into the airship port proper. Move along. Damn! The wall surrounding this airship port is thicker than the fat lip Brega gave me the first time she caught me with her brother. Wait! She caught you more than once? That's not important now. We should look forward, not back. <laughs> Any of you lot ever flown by airship before? My clan lives under the mountains near Dragonheart. I've never had the need to leave the island. Not me. My parents were from Chimia, but I was born here in the IRD. He said that while his parents were from Chimia, he's a native son of the IRD and has never left the island. How about you? I've been on several expeditions for the archaeology department, but we always flew out of Dragonwing, on the north end of the island. Their airship port doesn't have anything remotely like this wall. <laughs> you gents do know that only citizens of the IRD actually refer to your cities as Dragon This or Dragon That, right? <laughs> Someone want to fill me in on the joke? Sorry, Trollness. While the first explorers of Draconia thought the map of the island looked like a majestic dragon in flight, pretty much everyone else sees a flying pig. They replace dragon with pig when they speak about any of our towns. Dragon heart becomes pig heart, dragon wing becomes pig wing, and dragon strength is called ham for some reason. At least it's better than what we call University City. Do I even want to know? Probably not, but I'm going to tell you anyway. On a map, the University Peninsula looks like a blob coming out of the southwest end of a northeast-facing pig. For some odd reason, knowing the rest of the world refers to the city housing the University of Arcanum as the city of pig shit, actually it makes me feel better about things. The reason the pig ship port has walls this thick and this high is to protect the airships from the occasional brutal storms that hit here. These storms bring winds that would toss the airships around like toys in a toddler's tantrum. By the time the storms make landfall and reach pig wing, they're just a fraction of the strength they started at. 
All right, I have to ask, why are there two totally different types of airships? Some have gas sacks above them with propellers at the back, while others have those long wooden outriggers, no propellers, and a set of wind sails instead of gas sacks. Two designs for two different types of flights. Over there with the outriggers is a ship. They are used for long distance hauling between the major shipping ports. Like their name implies, they draw their power from the ley lines that crisscross Hadronis and use the magic to levitate and propel them. Each ley ship has a magical battery that they can use to levitate if they leave one of the ley lines. The batteries aren't normally powerful enough to provide thrust, so the airships rely on wind power to move them. And the others? Those are mech ships. They burn coal to power their steam engines. While they aren't tied to ley lines, they do have to stop and refuel frequently. I would have thought that as a dwarf, you would know this stuff already. Damn it, Gareth. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. High above them, an airman wearing a red tunic fell off of a passing dirigible when the railing he was leaning on gave way. The railing had been a design flaw the crew had complained about frequently to their engineer. We should see if we can help that man. He's dead, Gareth. Ugh. Sorry, it felt like someone just poured ice water over my bones there for an instant. Forgive this ignorant dwarf for asking a stupid question, but why don't they have steam engines on leyline ships? I would think it would be much more efficient. The same reason as why there were two types of diving rigs. There will always be religious fanatics willing to destroy anything that might combine magic with the mechanical. Oh, thank goodness! You have no idea how hard it is for me and the crew to hide the fact that we're heretics. We're much happier when we don't have to watch what we say. Henry, turn right at the next set of docks. Look at that beauty! If there was ever an airship that deserved to be called the Glorious Dawn, it would be her all right. That's the Retribution. She's one of the IRD's pirate hunters. Yes, she's impressive with her eight cannons and a length of 250 feet and height of 75 feet, but she's no Glorious Dawn. My baby's behind us. Granted, the Glorious Dawn only has one cannon and is 140 feet long and 35 feet tall, but she's the best thing to ever fly the skies of Adronis. Excuse me, Izzy, but I left something back on the wagon. Gareth, can you come help me for a moment? You're the one who packed everything. Uh, sure. No problem. Now, like I said earlier, I'm not an engineer, but even I can see that wreck has so many different colored wood patches. I'm not sure if anything is left of the original ship. Not to mention, with its front cargo ramp down like that, it looks less like an airship and more like a beached whale about to be sick all over the dock. I agree completely, but what choice do we have? If what Brega said was true, no other airship would be willing to take us. <sighs> You're right. I wish I could blame this all on you wanting to shag that triad. But let's face it, she was hot, and I would go through much worse to show that lovely tree spirit what dwarvish wood is really like. Alright, grab my medical bag so Izzy isn't suspicious when we go back over to the glorious dawn. Did you find what you're looking for? Yep. Can't treat the crew without my medical bag. Not to mention tetanus shots for Gareth, Henry, and I. Wait here while I go get my sister Elizabeth. She's the captain of the Glorious Dawn and the other part owner. Elizabeth, where are you? Down here in the aft cargo trying to see if I can glare hard enough to make cargo magically appear. Sorry, Izzy. I didn't mean to take it out on you. Did you have any luck speaking to the shipping guild? Not really. Good old Dick Nutless blacklisted us with the entire shipping guild of Draconia. 
I was informed rather rudely that we wouldn't be able to get a contract to haul garbage off this stupid island. However, I did manage to line us up a job with an independent. If that's the only job we can get, then I guess we'll have to swallow our pride and take it. So long as we aren't smuggling anything too harmful. Oh no, nothing like that. A professor from the University Arcanum wants to hire us for an archaeology expedition. He's bringing a doctor and the doctor's butler with him. The doctor agreed to provide the crew free services while on board. I think it's a good deal. We can use the money they give us to buy cargo here to sell along the way and make an even bigger profit. Slightly glazed eyes and goofy grin. Yep, I know where this is going. I suppose it doesn't hurt that the professor is good looking. God, yes, he's... I, I mean, that has nothing to do with the job. Oh, and from what they said when I brought them to the ship, they're heretics like us. Let's go speak with the professor and see what kind of deal we can strike. Just try not to scare them, okay? We really need this job to keep the old girl flying. Also, I have a gut feeling about them. Our luck may finally be changing. From that grin on your face, I'm pretty sure it's not your gut you're listening to. Besides, what makes you think I might scare them? It's not my fault people get freaked out by my missing eye, the burns all over the right side of my face, or the fact my right arm has been replaced with a clockwork contraption. Actually, it's more the constant scowling and the way the claws at the end of your arm start spinning at random. You're never going to let me live that down, are you? That poor wool merchant actually wet himself and tripped over one of his sheep as he tried to run away. When he woke up and found you looming over him, he started yelling something about demons with blood red hair and then passed out again. My hair's not that dark. Uh-huh. Whatever. Just be nice for once. Try to smile when we talk with the professor and his team. Like this? On second thought, just stick with scowling. It suits you more. Come on, the longer we talk about this, the longer we have to stay on this God's Forsaken Island. Looks like Izzy's coming back. And she has her sister with her. Well, I have to say, I'm really impressed that someone who's gone through so much pain could go on to captain an airship. You know, with that wicked looking clockwork arm paired with the sword and revolver tucked under her belt, I can't tell if I'm more terrified or turned on. Elizabeth, I, I mean Captain Morgana, I would like to introduce you to Master Henry of the Wuha clan, Dr. Trollness Granite Staff, and Professor Gareth Mintel. My sister tells me you are wanting to charter my... <clears throat> I mean, our airship for an archaeology expedition. Before I agree to transport you, I need you to answer some questions for me. First two are, where do you want to go and how much are you willing to pay to have us transport your team and equipment? Captain Morgana. We are willing to offer 5,000 IRD marks in exchange for transport to a spot approximately 200 miles to the east of Kansas. We'll need three cabins and a small corner of your cargo hold for our equipment. I would also be happy to perform the duties of ship surgeon while on board. You do know that 200 miles east of Kansas is in the middle of the narrow sea, don't you? That's why we brought the diving suits. This must be a site of some importance if a dwarf is willing to go diving. Don't remind me. I take it we will be splitting the artifacts recovered using these standard rates? Actually, I was thinking more along the lines of a 50-50 split. Half? Ladies, excuse us for a moment while I speak with Dr. Granite Staff. What are you doing? The standard rate is 5% for the airship, 5% for the expedition team, and the other 90% for the university. By the university, you mean the same bastards that basically tossed us out on our arses 
in favor of a place that will do their nails and give them rapid genital handshakes? So, what you're saying is... Screw those arseholes. Besides, we should get 50% anyway since I used my own savings to match what those penny-pinching, centipede-buggering fools gave us. Well, when you explain it that way... I'm sorry for interrupting the negotiations. Kroll has reminded me of some facts I had forgotten about. Not the least of which is that he's the primary private backer for our expedition. A 50-50 split will work out fine. Oh, and did we mention that the site we will be heading to slipped into the ocean during the Second Great Apocalypse? From what I've heard, relics from the Second Great Apocalypse are extremely rare and in high demand among collectors. Doctor, we have a deal. If you three will follow me, I'll introduce you to the rest of the crew. Let me grab some of our stuff first. Leave those there. I'll have our cargo master come get them. He's very particular about where things are stored in his cargo bay. All hands to the cargo deck. There's some new people on board that I want to introduce you to. What the hell is that? Easy, Henry. That's just a quaqua er. I'm not surprised you've never seen one before, since they're rarely encountered outside of their native swamps. Quaqua er are tertiary beings, with the qua eye stalks fused to an er body, a species without eyes of their own. The qua get protection and mobility, while the er gain vision and a way to communicate with the other sentient races. Sheldon, I would like to introduce you to our new employers, Professor Gareth Mental and Dr. Charles Granite Staff. Did she just call this guy Professor Mental? Well, let's be honest, he'd have to be to hire us. <laughs> hey, Doc, you got anything for snoring? This big galoot snores so much that I haven't had a decent night's nice sleep in weeks. I'll see what I can find. Thanks. Hey, Jim, how's it hanging? You know, because Jims were originally tree dwellers and they hung for branches. Wow, rough crowd. Sheldon, their stuff is in the wagon parked on the dock next to us. Why don't you go get it before your two comedians say something that we will all regret? Hey, knock it off with the overly vigorous head nodding, or I'm closing my eye the next time we play catch. Let's see how well you play without depth perception. His name's not really Sheldon. It's just what we call him. <laughs> I totally understand. While I can read and write Irish, it's impossible for a human to speak their language. The only time I've ever heard a human voice come even remotely close to pronouncing an Irish word correctly was at a faculty party. It turned out that what I thought was a linguistic breakthrough was actually just someone trying to swallow a live chicken on a drunken bed. You asked for the crew, Engineer the Glorious Dawn. Yes, I did, Pilot. Hey, did you do something different with your head quills today? My father, who sleeps on the left side of the nest, suggested I try a new quill polish. I was finally able to find a bottle in this section of this airship port's duty-free section. It really suits you. Anyway, pilot, these are our passengers. A professor, a doctor, and a butler. Enough of that silly formality. My name's Trollness. What's your name, lad? I am the pilot of the Glorious Dawn. Trollness? The pilot is a Rohus. In their culture, people don't have names like we think of them. To a Rohus, a permanent name doesn't make sense. They believe that a person is constantly growing and changing. Also, everyone presents a different side of themselves depending upon their current situation. The Rojas use descriptors or refer to themselves by their position instead of names. The tallest passenger is correct. At this moment, I am the pilot of the glorious dawn. When I holiday with my parents, I am the son who is returning for a visit. Gods! That's a mouthful. 
it is actually quite a bit easier to say in our language. He's right. In his language, the son who has returned for a visit sounds like this. You have excellent pronunciation, professor who speaks the people's language. That just leaves our cook. If you have anything other than cast iron stomachs, you might want to consider buying enough dried rations for however long you think the expedition will last. I should warn you that he's a scaled one, so you probably have a pretty good idea of what they're like. <laughs> you better get your pet on a leash. Egite? What the hell is wrong with you? These are paying passengers. I am sorry. I'm just not used to slaves being allowed to threaten people like that. It reflects so poorly on their master's ability to control them. They are just mindless, stinking beasts after all. That's it. I've heard enough. He's not worth it, Gareth. Speak like that again about my friend, and I won't listen to him when he tells me you aren't worth the trouble. Next time, I'll introduce your smirking face to my boot. Did you, did you hear him, Captain Morgana? He threatened me, a member of your crew. What are you going to do about it? <sighs> Professor Minzel, I promise I will keep Eggite away from you and your friends for the duration of the voyage. That's it! That's all you're going to say? Either that filthy beast stays here when we take off, or I do. Eggite is the ship's cook, so unless one of you would be willing to fill his place, we are going to have to come up with some sort of compromise. <laughs> What do you say, Henry? You are always complaining that cooking for just Gareth and I isn't challenging enough for you. <laughs> sure. Sounds like fun. There you have it. Henry would love to take up the cooking duties. Did I mention Henry was top of his class at the Dragonheart School of Culinary Arts? Even I've heard of the DSCA. Chefs from across the Dronas compete to earn a chance at learning there. Henry's got my vote. Give us a moment to discuss this amongst those of us attached to one another. Yeah? Uh huh. That's what I think, too. For once, the three of us agree on something. The gym stays. Pilot, come on, friend. You aren't going to stand for this treatment of me, are you? Barely adequate cooking. My people have a saying perfect for situations like this. Do not let the cargo rep hit you on the ass on your way out. Eggite, you have 20 minutes to get your belongings off the glorious dawn. After that, I'll have Sheldon toss you and everything else in that filthy nest of yours overboard. For nothing, you filthy mammals. Let me take you to the galley, Henry. After you give it a look over, I want you to write up a list of what you think we need to make it a place worthy of your talents. <laughs> what in the name of my fuzzy nuts is that? I already told you. I have no idea what that thing at the back of the icebox is. My suggestion is to grab one of those glass jars over there, put the thing in it, tighten the lid as if your life depended on it, and then give whatever it is to Trollness to see if he can identify it. Will you do it? Hells no, I won't do it for you. You might touch me. I have a very strict policy on not going near anything that looks like it might be an eldritch horror that recently came into existence. <coughs> oh, hello, Izzy. Huh? Uh, hi. 
Normally, I would say I hate to interrupt, but not this time. I ate breakfast here this morning, and I'm not sure I can keep it down if I hear any more. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I ate before we left pig shit, and I feel the same way. On a different topic, please call me Gareth. You're not one of my students. I wonder how many of his students sign up just so they can ogle his butt. How can we be of service, Izzy? Elizabeth wants me to go buy some cargo to take with us on this trip. I'm off to the trading bazaar inside the port walls and wanted to see if Henry had a list of what he needs put together yet. Henry put the list down on the table. It's held down by the only clean pot we were able to find. Sorry, Henry, but I can't read Chimish. It's not Chimish. Henry just has really lousy handwriting. <laughs> Foot writing, <laughs> damn it! Okay, I'm sorry. I meant lousy foot writing. How many times have I told you your penmanship goes to the hells when you use your feet? Izzy, if you would like, I could go with you and translate Henry's chicken scratches for you. I would be honored, Gareth. Come on, the bazaar is just a few docks north of here. So what's the story with you and Henry? You looked like you were going to tear Egide apart with your bare hands. Henry was my first friend. We met when I was only five years old, and I was living in an orphanage on the bad side of pig shit. Even in the IRD, gyms are treated like second-class citizens, and Henry lived only a few blocks from the orphanage in the same ghetto. We would meet every day at the park and switch off between playing and him teaching me chimish. After a few weeks of being friends, some older kids in the neighborhood got together and decided it would be fun to take out their aggressions on a tiny chimp. They knew that the city guards would believe them instead of Henry if he were to fight back. They thought picking on Henry would be safe and easy. After school, the bullies waited in an alley by the park to ambush him. Go on! I was with Henry when they stepped out from the alley. I knew he wouldn't fight back, so I stepped in front of him and told the bullies they'd have to go through me first. What happened then? <laughs> we got our asses well and truly kicked is what happened. Lucky for us, one of the city guards saw the beating and stepped in before he got too bad. I got sent to the clinic and the bullies got to spend a weekend in jail. For the next five years, the odd band of bullies would wander into our neighborhood and try to pick a fight with Henry. With each passing year, their insults became worse and worse. I knew what it was doing to Henry to not fight back, so I stepped in every time. And like every time before it, we got beat up. At least we got beat up standing side by side. Henry is the hairy brother I never had. That is both the most horrible and yet wonderful thing I've ever heard. So how did you meet Trollness? Remember how I said we kept getting beat up? Trollness worked at the clinic in the ghetto, donating his time. After patching me up for five years, he said he might as well get guardianship of me, considering how often we saw each other. Imagine my surprise when the orphanage matron pulled me out of class the next day to tell me a Dr. Trollness Granistaff had convinced the local magistrate to grant him custody of me. That's so sweet! Even though Trollness lived on the other side of the city, I still managed to make it to our park a few times a week to see Henry. A couple of years later, Henry's parents died in an accident. True to form, Trollness took in Henry as well and sponsored both of us for the schools of our choice. Henry went to the DSEA, and I went to the University of Arcanum. I became the youngest professor in the university's history, and Henry was the only Chim to ever be accepted at the DSCA. He even managed to become head of his class as well. Henry could have worked at any restaurant he wanted to. Instead, he moved back home and informed Trollness that he was going to be our butler, regardless of whether we wanted one or not. So the three of you aren't just friends. 
You're more of a family. Uh, I guess so. Well, as much as a kinky dwarf, a chim with a questionable sense of humor, and an orphan muti- uh, human, uh, could be a family. I recognize the white stripes of a doctor on Trollness's jacket, and the black vest of a butler for Henry. What do the stripes on your jacket mean? What exactly does Professor Mental do at the University Arcanum? The wide blue one means I'm a professor for the School of Languages. The brown one shows I'm an adjunct professor for the Archaeology Department. The narrow green one indicates that I'm a researcher with the Department of Applied Magics. Until recently, I mostly taught classes in the School of Languages, and a few in the Archaeology Department, when they were short-staffed due to other professors being out in the field. All of my duties have been suspended until I finish this expedition. Applied magics? Does that mean you're a wizard? I've never met a wizard before. I'm the farthest thing from a wizard you can find. Quite literally. Have you ever heard of the extremely rare wizards known as mages? Those are the blokes who don't even need a focus object to perform magic, right? Yes, they're extremely rare. At any one time, there might only be 20 or 30 of them on the face of Hadronis. People like me, we're just as rare. I have no magic whatsoever. Not even the slight glimmer that most of the population has. What do you do for applied magics if you don't have any magic? I would think you would need to be at least an adept to be of any use to them. Each of the major universities around Hadronis has at least one person like me working in their applied magics department. Since we don't radiate magic, we're able to calibrate divining equipment to a much finer degree than anyone else can. We're also the only ones who can sketch out experimental runes without the danger of the runes getting energized before they're ready. I never thought about that before. I can see why they would want you to work with them. You said your primary job, however, was with the language department. How many languages do you know? Uh... 18, actually. You're kidding! Wow! Hey, look over at those two blue skin Gucci. What are they talking about? <coughs> Nothing really exciting. The one closest to us? He was telling the other one about a new well blubber restaurant he found. I've always wondered what the other species were talking about. This is going to be awesome! How about that Rojas over there? The one pacing back and forth. She's, um, she's been gone from home for quite a while. Right now she's planning out in rather graphic detail what she and her husbands are gonna do when she gets all three of them in their mating chamber. Good for her. And what about those centaurs yelling at each other? Are they fighting over a female or something? Hey! Cry Eve, as Rokas Andersmos Horum Travis come. Care to share the joke with the rest of the class, Professor? The centaurs were arguing over which death ball team they supported would end up taking the championship this year. I told them to cheer up. At least they weren't Holton Trampler fans. The Tramplers are so bad, they've become something of a national joke. Just out of curiosity, what kind of cargo are we looking to buy? Well, since Consus is pretty far up north, I thought we would try to get as many crates of pig nuts as we can get our hands on. Excuse me? What? Pig nuts? Why don't the local farmers just raise more pigs? I would think it would be a much more economical solution than importing them. Huh? What are you talking about? Pigs? (laughs) Oh. What do you call those small brown fruits with the hairy outer rind? You know, the ones with the green insides that only grow here? You mean dragon tears? You have to admit, our name for them makes a lot more sense. Hmm. That must be why Trollus always insisted we buy our produce at that one shop that had a banana between two dragon deers as its logo. Well, he is a dwarf. The 
this has been Gareth and the Lost Island. Episode 4, starring Peter McGiffin as the narrator and Henry's translator. Alan Petty as Troutness Granite Star. Patrick Mallard as Gareth Mintel. Deborah Mallard as Izzy Morgana. Jeff Vesterhull as Airship Port Guard. Lauren Kong as Elizabeth Morgana. Daniel Four as Sheldon's left eye stalk. OJ VA as Sheldon's right eye stalk. Casey Swan as Pilot. And Lauren Sterling Knott as Egite. No eldritch horrors were harmed during the recording of this show, even though we tried as best as we could. In the end, we just tossed them back in the icebox. On that note, please remember, evil food tossed into a fridge never dies. It just goes bad. Gareth and the Lost Island was written and directed by Patrick Mallard. <laughs>